Hello, everybody. Welcome. We'll be starting in just a moment here. We're so excited to have you joining us. Well, hello. My name is Nick Quinlan. I am the Chief Operating Officer of Major League Hacking, and I am so glad each and every one of you has decided to join us for this webinar today. Today, I am joined with an incredible group of people. Uh, I think so. I'm obviously biased, but I think some of the uh, great minds in the world of hackathons, I am so excited for them to share some of their insights with you and talk about the last 10 years of hackathons. Over that time, we have seen so much growth and change in what hackathons are, who's participating in them, what they look like, and what people are producing. So I'm going to turn it over to them to tell us all about that uh, over the course of the next 45 minutes here. Over the course of today, uh, we'll be able to ask them, I'll ask them some of my questions, but please, if you have questions as well, throw them in the chat or use Zoom's Q&A feature. At the end of this session, I'll be going through and asking the, our panelists some of the questions that you've submitted over the course of the conversation that we have today. I know that we have a ton of great people in the audience from hackathon attendees looking to get a leg up in their next hackathon to DevRel leaders, CEOs, and all the other people who know the importance of hackathons and what they can provide to individual hackers, to the community writ large, and to the companies that participate in the events as well. So I am excited to jump in today. I'm going to, like I said, turn it over to each of our panelists. I'm going to have each of them introduce themselves, telling us who they are, as well as their, because we're joined by such incredible people, their story in the hackathon community. Um, how did you, each of you end up in the hackathon space? So uh, let's start with uh, let's start with Brandon. Brandon, why don't you go ahead and tell us uh, a little bit about yourself, who you are, and how you got started in hackathons? Hey, everybody! Uh, thank you for the invitation. Really happy to be here with our friends and partners, MLH, uh, whom we work really closely with. So I'm founder and CEO of DevPost. Uh, we are a hackathon platform. Um, we have worked with MLH for a long time to power their hackathons, and then we power uh, virtual hackathons as well. I um, I admire people. I'm an entrepreneur, and I admire people who can do 50 different things and be happy at each one of them, but that is not me. I sort of need to be doing one thing or else I'm like really miserable and you probably don't want to be around me. So I, um, I, I was in the music industry. And we're working with creative artists and just very briefly um, when, uh, had always been inspired by technology, started seeing these grassroots competitions sprout up on the web to solve technical problems. And I called them up and there was no platform to support these uh, competitions and there was no community for them. So that's why I started uh, DevPost to be a platform and community for technical problems uh, and competitions. And um, so that's my history. We launched a long time ago, 2009. And so we've seen a lot in the hackathon space and um, happy to, to still be here and growing. Well, we are so happy to be a part of that journey as well and to be working with you. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, our co-founders here. Uh, Swift, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do and how you got into hackathons yourself? Amazing. Well, I'm really excited to be here with everybody today. These are, uh, as you said, some of the top minds in hackathons. Um, I'm Swift. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Major League Hacking, or MLH, as we're commonly known. Um, our mission is to help empower the next generation of technical talent and helping them learn the skills and build the network that they need to be able to go out and launch their careers. Um, and we do that through programs like hackathons and internships where aspiring technologists can get their hands dirty with code and the tools that they'll actually use in their career. And, you know, I, that experience is one that's quite intimate to me. But back when I was a student, I was an aspiring lawyer who actually uh, was a programming on the side to pay my bills through university. Uh, and one day, my friend invited me to my first hackathon, uh, and I'd never heard of one before, and I didn't really know what to expect. Uh, when I showed up, it was uh, easily one of the best experiences of my life. 
It was creative and hands-on and uh, just a different kind of transformational educational experience that I'd never um, seen before. And I decided the next day to switch my major to computer science, where I started showing up to all these classes and very quickly realized that the things you learn in a CS classroom are not really the things you need to be employable as a, an engineer in tech. Uh, and rather, I was getting a world-class education at hackathons every weekend, again, using those tools that I was going to use on my journey. And so John and I founded Major League Hacking as a way to help um, every new technologist in the world make sure that they have you know a community and a platform and a place where they can you know learn those skills and ultimately build the track record they need to um, get their start in industry too and hopefully a lot easier than we had it back in the day um, and that's me. Shall I jump in here? Um, Please, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm our uh, final panelist here. I'm John. Uh, I'm the other co-founder of MLH. Um, before MLH, I was a prolific uh, hackathon organizer, participant, uh, uh, sponsor at various points. And um, I really just fell in love with the community and all of the creativity that was uh, coming out of these events and, and all of the interesting people who went to them. Um, that kind of led me to a career in developer evangelism and eventually starting MLH here. Um, you know, these days I focus mostly on, you know, finding really mutually beneficial ways to integrate our sponsors and, uh, you know, DevRel teams into our events. Um, but uh, I, I was uh, one of those participants and organizers uh, as well. So I understand kind of both sides and how they play together. And it certainly changed a ton over the last decade. Um and I'm uh, really excited to talk more about it. Well, thank you all for being here. As you can hear, a ton of great hackathon experience here. And we are going to dig right into that. So if, I, I kind of want to start with you. You talked a lot about how we, at MLH we see ourselves as in, impacting a developer's journey. Can you talk a little bit more about the role that hackathons play in developers' journeys from what you've observed? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, I think that, um, you know, as I was saying when I did my my intro, right, there's a, a big gap between the theoretical concepts that we teach in a classroom um, and the actual practical skills that you need uh, as an engineer. And, you know, that's certainly true of computer science degrees. Um, you know, even the most um, cutting edge universities tend to have problems keeping up with the pace at which technology changes. I mean, also is true of, of, you know, something maybe even a little bit closer to practical, like a boot camp, um, where you're learning, you know, the mechanics of a language, and that might be a little bit uh, disconnected from actually using the, those, um, you know, the syntax and structure you're learning to actually solve problems. Uh, and we found through, you know, decades and decades of, of developer experiences, the best way to learn is actually just to use code to solve problems. Um, it's actually, you know, a, a good parallel here might be thinking about art school, right? Like imagine going to school to be a painter um, and you watch a professor paint every day and learn about all the history of art and color theory. When you graduate, you've never actually put a brush to canvas. You're not just going to miraculously be a great painter. It takes years of practice. And the same thing is true for developers. Now, hackathons are a place where, you know, you can actually, you know, get your hands into those tools, into that code and actually build something material that's, Maybe you know a bit of a prototype you built in the weekend, but it's representative of the types of problems that you as a developer would solve with code. Um, and not only that, but they tend to be really collaborative and you know constrained events that ultimately create a positive social peer pressure that allow people to you know really have a transformational educational experience. You know, a really good way to think about this is you know, anybody can work on a personal project in their dorm room or, you know, at, in their spare time between, you know, after work, whatever. Um, but the reason a lot of people don't do it is because they don't have the motivation or the structure to be able to actually, you know, dive in and, and you know, ultimately maybe get started in the first place or maybe see it through at the end. Um, but hackathons are, you know, an event that allows people to have, again, that positive peer pressure, that that time constraint and, you know, dedicated space to do that. And often really great resources like, code like you know software credits or hardware credits or um mentors or you know swag or free food um, which are all things that can and, and often do show up at hackathons uh, to motivate people to be there in the first place so um, yeah i think they're really important again you know they just working on projects and getting real practical experience is really important hackathons tend to be the easiest and most common way for people to do that outside of you know working on personal projects it can be really tough and scary and difficult to actually do 
Thank you, Soya. And I, you know, I think Brandon, I'm going to turn to you next and ask you this this question. I think one thing that's really interesting to me is that DevPost gets to interact with hackers past the point where MLH is really focused on them, where we're working with students. You work with tons and tons of professional engineers as well, and so you get to see a different part of that journey. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, and I would I would echo Swift's comments that you know learning through building, uh, whether you are a college student or professional de developer or both, that doesn't change, um, and it's so important. And probably the number one reason that uh, people run hackathons, and number one reason that at least in our experience, people excuse me, the first number one reason people participate in our experience, number one reason probably people sponsor them is because you actually get people's hands dirty with the tools. The collaboration, as Swift said, without question, I'd maybe add a couple things or, or echo. One is uh, urgency. So look, there's nothing Thing like a deadline that gets people to move uh it just is whether it's for yourself or it's imposed upon you it's it's really important that creates urgency gets you to that finish line and then um and then respect you know when they when these are well run um you can get prizes without giving up your intellectual property um and you, you can even fit them into your life which i think to your question, if you're a professional developer, maybe you're not going to be able to do three day all night weekend hackathons as much as you could when you were a student, but maybe with a longer horizon um, and where businesses can participate, um, it can work. And so that, you, you know, a little bit of a tweak on the in-person hackathon where there's perhaps more time, um, perhaps the resources are different. There's more time for um Q and A uh, over a longer period of time. Maybe you have more time to even work on your application, not just find time to get started, but actually to polish it. These are things that I think are different. And to your to your question on professional de developers and also what they get out of it. Uh, the idea of learning new tools, improving your career, uh, and making something that's going to help others that doesn't change. In fact, I think it becomes even more important. Well, you know, we're speaking a little bit about developers change in their career, but I, I want to transition and really talk about what we're going to dig in in the panel today is, is that the last 10 years of hackathons, we've seen a, a lot of changes and a lot of similarities in hackathons over the last 10 years. So Brandon, I guess I'm going to start with you and stick with you for a second. How have you seen hackathons evolve over the last 10 years? And, you know, has that change where they fit in a developer's journey, all that kind of stuff. You know, there are a lot of ways. I'm looking forward to hearing from others about, about it because there are so many. I would just say the first thing that comes to mind is I would say perhaps wider adoption and perhaps more polished because we have experience. Uh, but I think there are so many others um, from the ins and outs to how one puts them together, et cetera. I would just say, you know, there's a question we, we sometimes hear uh, you know, is there hackathon fatigue out there? Are hackathons, you know, I've been hearing this literally every single year since I started the company and the number of hackathons participants continues to increase. I don't think it's like a, uh, it's it's not like a, a kitschy thing. It, it's the idea of getting people together to learn and build. That, that's not going away. And, oh, throw some fun into it, like even better. So I, I would just say that they've grown in that sense based on some of these fundamentals that we're talking about here, like what makes them useful, what makes them fun, what makes them successful. So I think there's there's wider adoption there. And then I just think experience, we just learn about things like, oh, how do you stop you know, bad actors from doing something or how many credits does one need to actually do stuff? And there's so many, and I'm going to throw it, back to MLA too, I'm sure it could add a whole bunch more. Great. And I'm going to uh, have John keep keep this answer going as the uh, former history major who's given whole talks on the history of hackathons. Why don't you tell us a little bit more? I mean, I think it's, there's been some, sort of like a, a cyclical nature to it where in the early days, they were really scrappy very community oriented, you know, the sponsors were kind of incidental in a lot of ways. And I think probably, I don't know, like maybe five years ago um, is when they started to reach this like level of like being well-structured, being repeatable, being scalable, 
uh, you know, having sort of like metrics and and actual like quantifiable stuff like Brandon's talking about behind it. Um, and the pandemic like really disrupted a lot of that. Like all of these habits and all of these structures and all of these expectations really got kind of thrown through a loop. And, you know, organizers of both in-person and digital events had to rethink all the different ways that their events worked. Like, how do we make this engaging? How do we get people to know about it? How do we make it like valuable for sponsors? Um, and it feels like now we're we're kind of like, in some ways, like reinventing a lot of how hackathons work in the last year or two. Um, and I've seen this in digital and in-person events. Uh, you know, this comes down to the theme, it comes down to the value for attendees, it comes down to the communities around it, it comes down to the prompts, you know, like, what are the challenges, what are the, the things that, you know, you're being asked to work on. Um, and it's kind of a cool thing to watch, right? Because really, every generation of like, DevRel, you know, leaders, every generation of community organizers are putting their own spin on it. And now I feel like the, the, place where a lot of this is happening and where it's really exciting is around AI. And, you know, obviously there's still a lot of general purpose hackathons, but like a lot of the community energy and a lot of the really like novel stuff happening here is either revolving around developers building with AI tools or around hackathons that leverage some kind of like AI platform. We see this a ton at our events. I mean, we can talk more about that for a long time, but it's definitely a trend at the moment. No, I'd love to dig into that a little bit more. I, I know, Swift, you've been doing a lot of things with AI. Do you do you want to add to that? Well, uh, I would love, I want to circle back to the AI thing in a second, but I do actually want to continue the this what's changed the last 10 years question, because I think that there's another perspective that's really important for us to examine, which, um, you know, John and I started our careers working in DevRel. You know, I, I was working at SendGrid, John was working at Twilio. These are the earliest days of these DevRel programs. I was the first remote DevRel hire for SendGrid at the time. And figuring out how we as, you know, DevRel professionals engaged with hackathons um, was like a big, big part of what we did, right? It was like a big part of, of what we're figuring out. And I think that for a DevRel professional or somebody it's, you know, this is pretty much generalizable to any company that wants to get involved in hackathons. A lot has changed around how you're able to do that and what success looks like too. You know, back when we were first got our start, let's, I mean, even 10 years ago it was a few years after we had really gotten started with this stuff, but like 10 years ago, there were not that many hackathons where you couldn't, you know, ostensibly go to most of them. You know, it was really common to see a developer advocate from a company at every single hackathon that you went to over the course of an entire year. And it was really common for there to be these kind of flagship events that were large enough that literally the entire community would be in one place at one time. But today we're at the point where, you know, at MLH, we have weekends where we have 20 hackathons going on simultaneously around the world. And not only that, but they're, in, you know, they're in different countries and, and they have different requirements and different audiences. And it's impossible to be as ubiquitous as it once was with an individual going to these events. Um, and that has lended itself to a more programmatic style of engaging with events, which both involves owned events where you're planning hackathons that you know are about your specific technologies, um, as well as um, more hands-off activations, like a lot of the work that we do at MLH for our partners, where we're helping them have a presence at hundreds of hackathons around the world that they may not be you know, staffing individually. Um, I think that not only has that change, you know, kind of influenced what the day to day of, of somebody working in DevRel, you know, looks like, but also it's highlighted the importance of, of having some kind of, of plan or program in place to be able to be, be there in, in these moments of like light bulb learning when a developer is really getting their hands in the tools for the first time and to really focus more heavily on having better onboarding ramps for developers. So, and what I mean by that specifically is, you know, back in the day, 10 years ago, when you could be at every event, your developer evangelist could be the expert in like how to get started with your API. Today, if you can't have that person there, you know, handholding somebody through it, you really need better documentation. You need a, a free tier that somebody can sign up for at, in a weekend at a hackathon and isn't waiting around to, you know, have their account approved. You need to have a, some kind of digital community to be able to answer questions about, you know, API issues or, you know, how to do something that, that might be tricky. Um, and these kind of more remote, more um, hands-off, you know, kind of tooling and approaches, like that just needs to be a, a kind of baseline part of any strategy too. 
So I think that like that to me, you know, for this audience and the, the people who are you know watching this webinar, that the biggest change is that we went from being driven around individuals who are part of this community, who were building relationships, who were really there shepherding developers to, you know, use your technology and understand it to a more, it's, it's ubiquitous. It's a movement. It's something that's a requirement for every developer to, you know, in the world to do this at this point, if they want to, you know, have the type of experiences that, that you know, hackathons could bring. And, um, you know, to support that, you just have to have a completely different approach and, it's not the old, the old approach can't work. It's just you're never going to have the scale of what's out there, you know, to be successful in what in the you know scope of what's out there today. That's a really good point. I would love to, I, I guess, hear a little bit more about some of the advice that every one of the panelists have here in this this modern environment, where, as you're saying, so if you need to be scaled, you need to be able to not rely on in-person connections. What kind of advice do you have for for developer relations professionals or any any company that is supporting developers? Um, Brandon, I'll, I'll, we've been hearing a lot from MLH. Let's hear the dev post perspective for a second. Yeah, well, um, I mean, I agree with everything. And similarly, the change has been from when we first started, it was doing just public data sets. There weren't even that many APIs. So we would do competitions. It was like, here's some a static CSV. Go make something with that. Then you started getting some APIs. Then you started getting, you know, from companies. Then you had API first companies, such as, uh, you know, your, your Twilio's and your, your SendGrids and others. And then uh, now you have entire industries. Like we were talking about AI, crypto. I mean, crypto is essentially building on a developer platform, period. So that's really changed. So I think that also just speaks to the trajectory of these and hackathons and the importance of promoting uh, this and, and also the importance for participants in their future careers. That if it started with a static data set and now you have an entire industry based on feeds of data, that what does that mean for the future? It means that it's it's going to continue growing and we're all seeing that on a, on a daily basis. Um, and remind me the question. What kind of advice would you be giving in this in this modern world? And yeah. Based on you know, everything you're saying. For sponsors of competition. Yeah. So um, I mean, I, I I think that Swift really hit it, which is that it is it's part of a larger strategy. You're not going to just run one hackathon and, and that'll be that'll be it. Uh, we love in-person events. We think they're incredibly important. You can also complement those with scaled global events, like virtual competitions where anybody in the world can participate. We think both are important. Uh, they both work terrific together. Um, I think that, yeah, it's, as Swift said, it's not gonna take away from the importance of documentation and tutorials and one-on-one -on -one conversations and just traditional marketing, whether you're using even ads at some point or other forms of marketing. Um, but at the end of the day, if people want to get some somebody to build, <clears throat> they want to inspire them to build, um, that's where hackathons sort of have to come into play. And just one data point on that, um, we talk about this thing called the click to build ratio, which is if you click to register for a hackathon and then you go on to spend days, weeks, or months building, you know, we see often with virtual competitions between five and 33%. That means up to one out of every three people who click virtually for a global competition will go make something compared to, uh, you know, here's some credits um, where it's going to be much less than 1%. So I would just sort of turn that around a little bit, which is that if an organization feels that it's really important to their strategy to get people to build, then I think hackathons are a must. That's our take on it. That's a really great stat. And I'd, I'd, I'd never heard that one before. That's that's incredible. Um, we have a, a question in chat. Is there a place where uh, people can uh, get that stat somewhere? Do you have uh, something to plug with it? <laughs> Oh, we have a, I mean, we have a promotional deck. It's right in there. I'm happy to email it to anybody on uh, brandondevpost.com. Write me about anything, anytime, and uh, I'd be happy to send it to you. Incredible. Thank you. Um, turning back, uh, I think a, the DevRel professionals might be uh, thinking about their experiences in hackathons, maybe if they came up through hackathons. Um, as a student, which we're, we're seeing, and I cannot tell you how cool it is to see students who we interfaced with a, a decade ago now being developer relations leaders in one way or another. 
I, I, I'm curious, though, that we've seen a generational shift, too. So have you seen shifts in, in what Gen Z versus millennials versus uh, you know, so some of the adults, the Gen Xers, uh, at hackathons have wanted or needed uh, in the space? And I'm going to let anybody here jump in on that. I, I'm going to take a different angle in answering that question, because I don't know that I have a specific gen z versus millennial you know hackathon pattern but i think that um one one interesting observation having worked with a lot of devrel professionals who used to be prolific hackathon attendees is the difference of perspective and strategy when you are participating in a hackathon and experiencing it firsthand versus promoting a platform at hackathons uh, in a marketing or DevRel uh, position. Um, you know, I think that often people's memories of hackathons revolve around the experience of like working with their teammates and building a project and learning something new and like challenging their, you know, abilities. Uh, and it's actually quite difficult to take a step back and think about where did sponsors fit into that journey, right? Because when you're at the event, and especially for in-person events, you know, it flies by. And as a DevRel professional, what you have to be thinking about is how do you plug into that experience in an organic way so that people actually learn who you are and are uh, curious and incentivized enough to try using it in their project. Um, and that often requires a very different approach from some other types of marketing and a very different approach than what it's like being an attendee. You know, you have to think about things like, um, you know, how do I explain this in the context of the value it adds to a short-term project versus an enterprise buyer? How do I explain, you know, how to get started quickly in a variety of different languages and platforms that someone might be familiar with? Uh, how do I offer the smoothest possible sign up and support resources to get someone started? Um, and I think that's a really like kind of like interesting learning curve. I've seen a lot of DevRel people go through when they come from, you know, being hackers themselves. Um, the other thing I would add is that like, uh, you know, often people's memory is of the platforms they engaged with. But for most hackers who go to hackathons, they see a variety of platforms, they use some of them, and then they put the rest of them in their back pocket to use for a future project. And so marketing and DevRel and hackathons have multiple touch points that are required to actually hit your success metrics in a lot of cases. And I think that's really kind of like, I, I don't know, that's definitely been something that's changed over the years, but especially with MLH and the kind of programmatic DevRel that Swift's talking about, um, learning how that works and how to influence that and the ROI of that is incredibly valuable for, for DevRel folks. Right. It's re about repetition, right? Like yeah. what's that saying? You have to like tell somebody something seven times before they remember it or whatever. I mean, the truth is about a lot of technology, you know, you go to a hackathon and you might come up with an idea and maybe there was something cool that you saw that you wanted to try, but you know, it may not be top of mind for you to maybe it didn't fit in that project or whatever, but the next time somebody shows up, like, is it possible that they're going to use it? Well, if you, again, continue to introduce them to your technology and tell them what it is and tell them the benefit, the likelihood they're going to pick it up just continues to increase and the likelihood it becomes a default tool and someone's tool belt increases as well. So, you know, often programmatic hackathons in that vein, which again, I, and we're, I think we're really talking about like general hackathons that are based around where there's a variety of, of technologies present, not like I'm not, not the kind where I'm running a hackathon that's just my technology, right? So let's call that a marketplace, right? Like there's there's certainly multiple options that a, that a participant could look at. Repetition is key in it. And it is a long game. Uh, I'm going to borrow some stats from a talk that John gave uh, back in September at DevRelCon. But um, some of the things that we've observed at MLH over the years, and we, we literally have this like 10-year study of you know sponsor technology adoption. And what we found is that the technologies that were present at hackathons are incredibly sticky with developers when they learn them. And uh, we were able to show that over a 10 year time horizon that uh, developers preferred a specific cloud platform that was being promoted by MLH at those events, almost two to one compared to their peers um, in future cohorts where it was a different partner. 
Uh, and not only that, but, you know, it was sticky for years and years after graduation, right? And it's like the tools that someone learns are the tool on, are the tools they continue to carry with them. Um, and, then, and on top of that, we also found that about 37% of our alumni uh, had actually introduced a technology that they learned at a hackathon into production at work at their first job out of school. Uh, and so what it, that tells you is that you know, these kind of repeat long-term impressions early on in somebody's journey where they're able to actually, you know, get exposure, they matter because not only do they continue to build brand preference that's sticky, you know, for years of the future, but ultimately developers go on to be decision makers where they're actually likely to introduce uh, some of those technologies, likely your own into production um, and gain customers. Now, you know, as a, as a modern DevRel professional, that's a really, really hard line to draw when you're like looking at your Salesforce reports and being like, where did this new account come from? Um, you know, was it that hacker that I met five years ago who wasn't working at that company now? But, um, you know, if, if you're a leader of a DevRel program and you're thinking about what's the portfolio of initiatives that I'm working on, and maybe you have some short term things that, you know, are directly tie into signups and you have some longer term plays that tie into brand preference and, you know, buying potential over, you know, five year time horizon, um, you do want to have like a mix of those things and a pro and a portfolio that has um, a range of maturities and and kind of risk to it as well. And if if I may add, I I think probably soon we'll be uh, opening up for questions. But I I think uh, first of all, an amazing that's an amazing stat. Uh, I think to the the millennial. The Gen Y question. I mean, I guess there's the obvious thing, which is um, if one is younger and in college, look, in-person events are are more fun. They're social. There's no question about that. Um, but there are, and then perhaps as one becomes more of a professional, as, as we've said, you know, they, they might have less time to do that. By the way, plug to any college students who we don't get enough of you submitting to our online competitions and we welcome you. So please check them out. But I think to Swift's point, like um, there's this other piece about emerging technologies uh, as well, which is like earlier you mentioned AI. Um, it's the number one interest in our developer community by far. Uh, yes, we've been doing AI hackathons for seven or eight years, but what happened when ChatGPT came out is it changed the entire game. That's one of the beautiful things about tech. And I think one of the important things for, uh, for both MLH and DevPost, which is that you can tinker uh, and you can build. And having an AI strategy at the top of your company doesn't mean much until you have a bottom-up engagement where people are tinkering and saying, how can this help me? How can this make me make a great product? How can this help me save money or earn money or not miss the future? Uh, one more plug, which is we have a private hackathon product called dev post for teams if you ever want to do a private hackathon in your company uh, or in any organization um, we do that and i will just say that almost every hackathon that we are powering these days whether it is a public global one or whether working with friends at mlh for in person or whether or virtual um, and they have an awesome virtual series I believe going on right now that involves both local and virtual events, um, or whether it's private in an enterprise, AI is everywhere. And I think that just shows the importance of merging technologies, uh, that you can learn them, that you can tinker and build. And the best place to do that, I think, is at Hackathon. Thank you. Um, and thank you, each one of you, for your wonderful answers uh, to my questions. I'm going to turn now to some attendee questions. Uh, in this last little bit of our conversation here. Um, the first one comes from uh, Justin Brezhnev, uh, which is really talking about the, the that long-term trajectory of hackathons. Uh, over the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of change. How have we seen hackathons as a term change? How's the reception uh, to that word been over the last 10 years? I, I, I know I've seen a variety of uh, things come from somebody when I say I work at Major League Hacking or I do hackathons. What have you seen over the last 10 years when you're talking to uh, companies, when you're talking to uh, att attendees of hackathons and everyone in between? Uh, I'll I mean, just let go ahead. I, I certainly think it's become more mainstream, um, especially after, uh, well, when did the social network come out? <laughs> like what was that 2010 or something so like right when basically right when we all started in this like hackathons have become way more mainstream there's still a lot of jargon 
and jargon is often what communities use to identify each other and like build this sort of like intimate environment. And so I do think that like having some terms that your you know grandparents don't understand is actually really important to the uh, stickiness and power of developer communities. Um, but hackathons as a concept, I, I think are a lot less scary than they used to be. I remember in the early days of MLH, we used to do a lot of local TV news interviews at our events. And every single one started with, these kids are hacking, but it's not what you think. And, you know, I don't get that quite as much anymore. <laughs> I'm curious exactly. what you think, Brandon, like. No, it was uh, the amount of times I used to have to say, look, the word hacker has two definitions, right? You know, it's, it's you break, you hack into things or you're creative and you hack things together. And we're on the hack things together bit. That's, you know, that kind of hacker. And then, oh, okay. We still get security, you know, people who think that it's always a security related thing, like, you know, breaking in, like capture the flag kind of, or something similar. But yeah, it, not as much of an issue. I really liked, oh, if I may, I really liked the question. There was a question about, about social impact competitions. I think, uh, I, I think also from Bridge, but uh, is that okay if, if I speak to that one briefly? Please go for it. Um, and I'm curious what you all are doing. I would just say that social impact hackathons are something that they're some of the most favorite ones I've we've ever done, I've ever been a part of. And I'll just maybe just a little bit of advice on them for anyone who's thinking of participating in them. Um, you can't just put up a competition that says solve traffic in Mumbai. Uh, trust me, we've, we've done that one. Uh, you need topic experts. It's hard enough to come up with a project for something you actually know yourself. In fact, some in our surveys, some people spend more time ideating on a project uh, we have some new AI tools to help with that, but um, then they do actually building, which just blew my mind. Uh, but it's hard enough to come up with a solution for your own thing, let alone for a topic you might not understand. So highly would rec would highly recommend for social good related competitions that you have topic experts there. Ideally, it could be in person or virtually who will even join your teams or are doing office hours and are even providing personas. Here's a person who has this issue. This is what they have. We have some good examples on, on DevPost about that. Um, but uh, that, that would be the advice. If you just put up the problem, you're not gonna get great solutions in our experience. Nice, that's a great, um, great point. And I think an underlooked one uh, so frequently. We had one question come in in chat um, about where to find hackathons. You know, I, I think that that's important for our attendees, but it's also really important for developer relations leaders as they're thinking about what am I going to do with my next year? What am I going to do in 2024 as I'm thinking about my event strategy? I'm curious uh maybe a little bit of a softball but uh where would you recommend people find those well i can think of two sites uh one of them is and the other one's MLH. <laughs> no but i i think uh you know in, in all seriousness right like i think that depending on what you're looking for there's different places right if you're like hey I want to organize my own kind of online challenges and then get people, you know, doing those, or I'm running an internal hackathon. I need software for that. Like dev post the place to go. There's no better place. Right. If you're like, Hey, I need a programmatic strategy that reaches hundreds of hackathons a year with minimal staff overhead and, you know, has a quantifiable ROI, but MLH and reaching out to, you know, our team is a great, great starting point. If you're like, hey, I want to sponsor a local event in my community and like go there and be there in person, you know, often you're going to be better off, you know, local meetup groups or, you know, maybe there's a local university that has a hackathon. Um, they probably have a website for it. Or, and if not, you can probably reach out to the local student group there or reach out to MLH and, you know, we could introduce you. Um, but depending on your goals, like those are probably, you know, there's different, different places to go and, and certainly different, different reasons to reach out. But um, I think that if you're just like, I want to know what's going on in this space, like the two, two places to keep, keep an eye on are, are DevPost and MLH for sure. 
And I will add a compliment, which is in all my years doing this, I've never seen anybody that puts on as good um, in-person hackathons and they do great virtual ones too as MLH. I mean, there is a handbook online that goes through almost everything you could possibly imagine. Uh, you all, it, it's really phenomenal how you've been able to create this league with these high standards and then scale that out in person, which is just, a, 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 it's a huge, huge amount of work. Uh, I'm sure the participants, some of the participants know, but they probably don't know how, how much goes into these competitions. It's incredible. It takes a lot of love, a lot of experience, a lot of smarts, a lot of hard work. Thank you. Well, we're, we're big fans of each other here at MLH and DevPost. Clearly, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all have high standards. People come to us like, who do you, do you know somebody that can organize an in-person thing? And we like, it's like, no, unless it's like MLH, it's really hard to, to find. And uh, because they're really, really tough. Um, yeah. But yeah. If anybody knows other, other people that can organize local in-person events that aren't college hackathons or others, please let, let us know. Always looking. Um, and not to minimize the uh, cool virtual things that MLH is doing as well. Well, we're coming right to the end of our time and I'm going to ask each of you to answer one final question for me, uh, which is we've been doing this for 10 years, 10 plus years. Um, how do you hope the hackathon landscape is going to change over the course of the next 10 years? Uh, what are the things that you want to change What are the, or think will change? And what are the things that you want to stay the same? Um, John, I'll start with you and I'll uh, pick on you a little bit and let everybody else think on that one. <laughs> I mean, I think I... This is maybe counter to some of the things that I said improved about hackathons over the last 10 years. But I actually think that um, getting back to some of that scrappiness and community-oriented hackathon vibes is something I would like to see in the next 10 years. Um, I mentioned earlier, I'm, I've started seeing some of this in like the AI space where people are literally just getting together to hack. But I do sometimes fear that hackathons have become too results oriented and that that can quash creativity and, and the novelty. I don't think that's entirely happening yet, but I have seen cases where that has happened. Um, and a lot of the most interesting projects, a lot of startups and a lot of um, really kind of like powerful stories and connections and, and customers you know, back when I was doing developer evangelism, came out of events that were almost a little bit fluffier in terms of the metrics. Um, and so I think that, like, I would like to see events kind of be designed to serve both, you know, the ROI needs of DevRel professionals, because obviously that has to, that's a requirement to get funding and continue investing in these events, but also to sort of um, create an environment that has, you know, open-ended sort of like creative pursuit by the developers and designers involved. And, you know, I think the people in this room all sort of like implicitly understand that and and have that as like a core principle of a lot of what we do. But, um, you know, sometimes there's, there's a pull in one direction or another when you're actually a community organizer. I think that it's going to be um, in addition to that, just a, a function of where technology is heading. And I think that AI is is such an important part of that. I mean, there are applications now that you you just type in what you want your app to be, and they're fairly crude um, outputs, but they are actually applications based on just typing. Non-developers can do it. And I think you'll be able to very, very soon create applications by dictating it and have a wide variety of UIs to select from. I think that software development will only get bigger and easier, more accessible. And as a result of these technologies, <clears throat> and that uh, as a result, I think, you know, I, I'm not trying to sell this book, this, you know, my own book here, but I just, I see it happening. There's going to be more people joining hackathons. There's going to be more people making stuff. There's going to be more people making applications the same way that it has happened with internet, mobile phone and others. So I, I see it going there already, um, as I mentioned with some of that talk around what we see in the community around AI. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I think that uh, the way I was talking about it with somebody else earlier today was that, uh, you know, being a developer is shifting from being purely a cr creation exercise to a much more editorial exercise for a lot of people, right? These AI tools are a starting point that give you a lot of the boilerplate that, you know, frankly, you would spend a lot of time writing previously. And now it's about curating that and combining it in interesting ways. And um, it's a new level of abstraction for sure. Um, you know, I, I think the one thing that I'm really hoping to see over the next 10 years is better in event signaling about what's going on um, with participants and projects. I think like a lot of, you know, the, the challenge of being um, a DevRel professional at a hackathon is figuring out who needs your help and exactly how you can support them. And I do actually think that as tooling around hackathons gets better, both online and in person, we could get to a world where we can more easily signal who is working on, you know, projects that are relevant to your technology and create pathways for you to both understand what they're making and also help them when they get stuck as well. Um, and we're getting better at that. Like certainly that's, it's improving, but I th would love to see us make some leaps and bounds of that over the next 10 years as well. Well, incredible. Thank you all so much. I know we are at time here. And so I want to thank each one of you for joining us, for sharing your insights. Uh, and thank you to every participant and attendee who joined us as well. I know we didn't have the chance to get to all of your questions, but we might have time to do some follow up when we use the ideas that you, and questions you share here to make future uh, webinars like this, which we host every single month. So we hope that you join us and please do reach out as well. Uh, Brandon shared his email here and we'll also share MLH's details in the follow ups. We would love to hear from you and help you out in all the ways that you would like. Um, we are both companies here built on uh, supporting developers, engineers, and people who want to support them. So please do reach out. Thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you once again to our panelists. Thanks, everybody. Thank Happy you acting. so much.